Everybody, you're listening to and possibly watching the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Bill Zanowitz. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. And we are your hairy heavy homos that talk about comic books, but you don't have to be a hairy heavy homo to listen in. And we are newsless this week. I think maybe because there's been so much real world news. Yeah. Between the indictment so, and you yeah. know, unfortunately the passings of Sinead O'Connor and Pee Wee Herman. I'm, oh my god! Uh, yeah, it's, it's just been it's been a heavy heavy news cycle. Well, we're also on the tail end of of DC uh, or San Diego Comic Con, so like you know, yeah. there's that yeah. was that little vacuum right and after was, it. And you know, like the unbelievable heat. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I, but I, I got to tell you, the last three days have been gorgeous here, absolutely gorgeous. You know, I, I have to say, I haven't been looking forward to rain as much as I have for today. Today, it barely broke 70 degrees outside mm. uh, with all the overcasts and the rain yeah. and everything. There was a wonderful breeze this morning. I got outside walking the dogs and I'm like, this, it feels like spring if we're like early autumn. Like, it was just so nice. Yeah, and I know it was... it's going to be right back up to 100% humidity in 95. Yeah. Right That's what it, is. it was, so, it was. 106 degrees when I got in my car this afternoon. Oh, uh, we didn't we didn't get past 82. Uh, this is the first day we've had clouds since Monday. Um, I still stuck to my August resolution of getting out for <laughs> some swim or at least some some outdoors time at lunch each day. So I'm protesting and jealousy out of you guys. Yeah, well, <laughs> it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Uh, one thing that's not so okay, though, Steve, uh, if you see his little um, descriptive there, <sighs> got the Rona again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one came to uh, came to our household from uh, a we believe the tour of Ain't Too Proud um, that was playing in Charlotte last week. Uh, Jason was working the show, and I guess somebody, um, someone else in the crew, you know, some crew person, uh, wasn't feeling well. And then a couple days later, Jason wasn't feeling well, and he tested, and he was positive. I somehow, and we, we were able to quarantine in the house, like I slept upstairs and, uh-huh. you know, stayed out of each other's way. Um, and then two days later, uh, two or three days later, I tested positive, so... But, uh, but yeah, so this whole week I've just been dealing with it. Mm-hmm. What can you do? It was, it was crappy for a couple days and now I'm just dealing with the, the sinus-ness and the phlegm-ness. Yeah. And the fact that I can't go anywhere. So Yeah. Have you tested negative yet or still? Not yet today. No. Yeah. No, I was going to. Uh, I was going to test again tomorrow morning and see uh, see what it is because it's right now like I feel okay other than yeah. the side of stuff. Are um, you on Paxlovid? And, uh, no, no. This time, no. Last time we were, mm-hmm. um, but apparently for our age group, it actually really wouldn't didn't do much the last time and wouldn't do much now either. So All right. this time it's just uh, ibuprofen and Mucinex. All right. Well, I'm that's knocking all the wood. I've been a, I've been a doctor. Same coming out. Of it. This is me with my little popsicle sticks, my my little onesies. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep that going. The world's worst cheerleader. 
<laughs> I didn't like I I was agile at one point. I think I could have been a pretty good cheerleader. Oh, I'm sure. If I had the upper body strength to hold the girls up, I think I could have done. That. Oh, I've seen I've seen pictures of you back in your uh your your swimmer lifeguard days. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, if my brother could be a cheerleader at USC, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not coordinated enough. Like, I could never be a cheerleader. I could never be a drummer. Like, I have I don't have that coordination. Oh, my my all. downfall: basketball. Yeah, I am the worst basketball player in the world. If I do oh. free throws, you would think I'm blindfolded. I'm terrible at that, and I don't know if it was if if some of that is because you have like a, a very specific. Um, point of uh, point of focus with archery because when i really got involved with archery i got worse at other sports because interesting you, because it, it, it's more restricted where your aim is at in a sense i don't know um but oh. basketball it's like i don't have any coordination for it. it's sad it's it's like funny it's really i was fairly funny. fairly good at football they were like hey see that bigger hot guy get him I was like, okay. <laughs> <You know. laughs> did they, I, I did they put it that way? Was that how the I get to grab him push? and hold him and not let go for a yeah. little bit? We can just like cuddle on the ground for a while until you blow a whistle. Yay! I was it's in amazing the, that you never got into wrestling. Yeah, I was in the I white boy it. suburban version of Pop Warner. And gotcha, gotcha, um, gotcha. my mother freaked the hell out. Yeah. When I took uh, a hit, I was a fullback. Um, and she freaked out. And after that, I didn't. And then, then I went to soccer, and those are the biggest assholes I've ever met in my life. Or, well, uh, to Steve's point, we didn't have wrestling at, like very small town. Like I grew up yeah. in a town with like six hundred people. Even the towns next to us, the biggest one was like twelve hundred people. So very small town. Yeah. We didn't have wrestling, but I did get into boxing a little bit. There's a, a bigger mm-hmm. town about forty five minutes away, and yeah. so I would go there and had really good friends who were into boxing. Um, totally had a crush on one of them, so it was one of those things like you go do something because because of that. But like got got into boxing for a while and was fairly decent at it. Yeah. I love I love the art of punching, and that's what it is. Yeah, it's a punching. So now, I did some boxing too. The thing with me is I can't roll for shit. Yeah, I cannot do that for shit. Um, but it's, I would really like to get involved in a sport again, though. Um, mm. you know, even if it's just like even if it's just like going to batting cage. You know, I, I just need something. I wish yeah. I wish we had rugby nearby. I would love to get into rugby. Yeah. I've got some friends who are in a, like a gay rugby league in Atlanta. Um, I yeah. love what like you know following them and doing their stuff. Yeah. I would be really in. And I mean, it mixes my love of football. Uh, kind of, I'm a, I'm a rough and tumble guy. So like I like I just would really like to, I'd get into that yeah. a lot. I wish we had it here. And grabbing people by their underwear, uh, hoisting them, grab you know, holding them down. I mean, that's kind of like. Half of rugby, I believe. It's, yeah, it's a big. There's, there's a ball, ball that's involved, I yeah. believe. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very into sports, though. I mean, me and Bill. I mean, you, you've heard us talk about football. I love sports. I'm very, I like athletics. So I'm very much yeah. into that. So yeah, I but just wish we, we know, did not come even here. If to I was talk in, about the, the sad thing is, even if I was in good shape, there's a lot of stuff I can't do anymore. You know, for one yeah. reason or another. Even if I was in good shape at this age. Um, but I, I want to get into something regular and it can even be something myself, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, think I, might, I think come the fall, I think I'm going to try some batting cages. We have a bunch you of should. pieces around. Yeah. That's just, awesome. just to get something, something. Yeah. In, but Smacking something. And, and Steve not contributing to this at all. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. I did tennis <laughs> for a while. Yeah. Like I like tennis. Tennis was fun, uh, but I was a kid and then. I yeah, stop finding sports at all interesting mm-hmm. whatsoever. It's yeah. just something to do on a on a Thursday and a Sunday. Yeah. All right, I have something <laughs> to talk about. Let's get into it. Get let's get yep. into it. Okay. Um, I'm in a situation right now where I think I've fallen out of love with comic books. I don't have the passion for it. I don't have the energy for it. I don't have the commitment for it. I'm months and months and months behind on certain titles. Um, and very often in the past, like, I would say four or five months, uh, I've seen 
the act of reading mostly for the show as being a chore kind of homework. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want to be in this headspace. Um, now there've been times in the past where I got out of comics. Um, tail end of 1980, I was 13 years old and everything went to music. You know, everything went to bands and mm -hmm. Uh, I basically stayed that way until my mother died and that would have been midway through my senior year of high school. And then I'm, I'm like perfect timing for crisis on infinite earths, you know? Um, so I think that's why I always hold that particular series in such high esteem and kept through it with college until, um, about two years out when I had my first apartment and, you know, I sublet in New York City and Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much that cost. And, um, you know, that was something at that point that, uh, you know, it was a fading interest anyway, because that was just before Image started. And even before Image started, you know, like the Marvel books that some of those artists and writers were shepherding. We had Image before we had Image, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, in terms yeah. of, you know, books that were dominated by splash pages and semi splash pages and, you know, two page spreads and you could read them in three minutes. Um, and it was just, it was an easy time to get out. And I stayed in a little bit for big events like death of Superman zero hour. I remember when Morrison's JLA came out in 1997, I became a regular reader of that, but only that. And then mm. when I got into law school, that's when this really kicked in because I had no money and very little yeah. time. Um, and what I did was I earmarked Sundays as my day off. Mm -hmm. And when it was football season, it was football season. But, you know, I had stacks of comics I never read that I got into it and then just it just gelled and you know, started moving. And then that was, you know, combined with the internet and forums and things like that. And got into fandom really for the first time in my life. And that brings us up to present day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know specifically what it is. I, I mean, I'm looking at my to read pile and these are, you know, first two, three, four issues. I really loved, you know, Stargirl, the lost children, danger street, Superman lost. I was really digging this stuff. I haven't even touched those books mm. and I don't know how slash if to, if I'm going to get it back mm. and I almost put together a, a kind of conversation in my head with you two guys mm -hmm. about maybe you could run with this show for a few months and then I'd see where I'm at. Um, but at the same token, you know, I started this bitch and I also kind of want to shut off the lights. Um, I want to be the one to shut off the lights. Right. Know? And I can say, and this, I, I hate to sound like melodramatic, but if, if this show was a one man show, I would have ended it at this point. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't make sense because I'm like, I'm very excited about the ancillary stuff, the blue beetle film still buying toys you know, I, I'm still excited about things that are linked, but mm -hmm. the actual art form itself, like really the last book I got crazy excited and could not wait to read again was I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. And what are we that? What is that about two and a half years ago? Yeah. At this point. About yeah. That, about that. Yeah, I think at this point. Whereas mm. in any given year, there were like seven or eight projects that would do that for me well and it's it's interesting that you say that and put it that way because that was going to be one of my questions because the books that you you listed off and you named that you were you know you like the first issues they're all superheroes right yeah and, that's, and and you are you know you are in love with the superhero genre you love especially dc comics that was going to be my question is it the and, and genuine question like do you think it's the the medium of comics that you you're like you're just in a lull with, which happens, right? It it very much does. I've gone through it. Or is it the superhero genre? Because like you know, are there other things that you could dip your toe in? And and you know, I, I ask that because, and I'll talk about it more. Like I had to take a break um, from reading monthlies, right? Like, mm -hmm. and we talked about it on the show before. I took a break from from 
and just and let stuff stack up because I was not finding joy in it because we yeah. read so much. We read such a high volume and high quantity of books that I was reading something one month. It's going to be four weeks before the or five weeks before the next issue comes out. If it's on time, I'm going to read 40 books since then. And I don't know what I'm reading. So I was like, let me just build these up and go take care of some like graphic novels, some OGNs, some, um, you know, some omnibuses that are of all different kind of fare. So like, do you think maybe that's that's what it is? Would it help if you it's just possibly, you know, I do see the pandemic as very much for this show. Yeah. And some of my interests are very distinct before and after. Hmm. Um. And even then, you know, I'm thinking about when the pandemic started, you guys remember, you know, and a lot of things changed for us. That's when we did the video. That's when Caleb came on. There were a lot of things that changed for us. And I mean, if you hearken back, you know, for those first few shows, I was going to Walmart specifically for the goddamn Archie Digest yeah. because that was the only new comics that were being published. Exactly. You know, oh, I yeah. needed that thing. You know, I mean, you know, that's that's a passion. You know, that that's passion in some particular type of definition. And um, I feel like I'm worlds away from that person. But that was also when you got to that, Caleb, that was a, a turning point for me because I think real world isms, I just wanted to escape from it. I yeah. didn't want that mm -hmm. indie feel of like this could be your, you know, e even if it's dealing with like a, a, a mutated, you know, platypus that becomes a human, you know, it's, it's still like grounded in reality. Um, that down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know that I'll be right. I wanted and something me. so different from that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. that's where my head went. Um, it's possible, but even the indie stuff that I've, you know, been reading the last you know year and a half just doesn't hit me. Yeah, you know, yeah. it just doesn't hit me. And I, I know there's good books that I've read. You know, I know there's, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to some of the books that we spotlighted like gender queer and and uh kent state you know that you know yeah. this was stuff i really adored um but it was the superhero stuff that gave me joy you know mm. right and it was escapism that's not even giving me i'm not even getting that right now and you know there's some good stuff out there there always is good stuff out there it might not be at the top of the top of the heap in terms of popularity but it's just like music mm -hmm. there's always great music out there you might have to dig a little deeper at some points in history than others to mm -hmm. to find the stuff that you really enjoy um and i'm just glad to hear this because i know both of you have had times where you've exited oh yeah yeah I, and that's you, that's actually no, I was just gonna say like that it's it's always fascinating as to like when and why you know, that we feel kind of disconnected from things that we're super passionate about. I, I mean, what what you were talking about, like these these moments and these things where you're just sort of like, okay, this is what's happening in my life. This is what's happening here. And that's how I kind of fell out of comics or I fell back into comics because yeah. of this. And, and, you know, those patterns in our life with something that we're all passionate about, whether it's comic books or music or a particular sport or um just just anything any kind of interest um there are plenty of those situations in our lives where you know it could come and go but it's pinpointing like okay well where's that moment like what what was the influence what really hit it mm -hmm. and i mean the pandemic what we're talking about talking about now talking about you know how much impact this stupid pandemic had on what we could do what we couldn't mm -hmm. do what we could control or what we could focus on and what brought us joy and, and escape from, you know, what was essentially a pretty shitty time for, I think a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think in a lot of people's heads, they went all in. And now like a couple of years later where that's sort of that, that obsession is kind of fading away. I think people are kind of taking the time to reassess because they put, years worth of focus into essentially a year and a half where there wasn't any other choice. We, we couldn't spread yeah. out our joys, spread out our passion. We're just sort of like, okay, we got to put it all here because this is what we can get. Um, 
and I'm wondering if that's just sort of it, that overwhelming, you know, it's it's something that we can enjoy, something that we can do. It just kind of just burn people out. Really? It can burn somebody out. Yeah. And Steve, I think uh, I think you're making a very good point about you know turning to things during the pandemic. So I like and Bill, you mentioned you know during law school, uh, you know, just time wise and money wise to save. Um, I had a little bit of a different experience in that I turned to comics. So I was in law school in the middle of the pandemic. So I had, I was in like doing that and I've probably read more comics like weekly comics then than I do now or at any time in my life, because between the, just the aspect of dealing with a global pandemic, um, Trumpism and the law, like the world in law school, I needed fiction to detach myself from the very non like nonfiction reality that I was steeped in from school and the world and everything. So I, I, I delved into it. Whereas now, and, and Bill, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not to the point to where, where, where you are right now, where you, you know, you're worried that you've fallen out of love of comics, or you're just not feeling things in general. But I'm reading less, and part of that is because, based on circumstance, just the general state of the world, my job, where I'm at in life, things with my, my, my husband, and stuff like that. I don't need to turn to fiction as much as I did then, as mm -hmm. I do now, and. It's okay just to live in the reality of the world for a little bit. Like I love what you're doing and with your August resolution, you know, going swimming every day and being out by the pool and talking to people and just being in the world. And some of that, yeah, yeah, we like you're like me. We like we'll take a comic out by the pool, sit and read, and it's enjoyable. But you're going to concerts, right? You're going, you're 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 outside, you're you're commingling with your neighbors, you're swimming, you're getting some sunshine, you're being out in the world. And it's nice just to like we're at a state right now and the world has problems. Don't get me wrong. Like like there are a ton of stuff that are like you can't turn on the news without being depressed. Right. But we're at a place right now where it's a little bit better than it was three years ago. And I don't need blinders on so I don't go jump off a bridge because mm -hmm. the world we live in just is yeah. on a dumpster fire. Right. So yeah. so maybe I mean, that could be or it do. We, we are children of Renaissance men. Like, I don't know how else to describe us. We love sports. We love music. We love podcasting. We love comics. We love film. We love books. We love, we love immersing ourselves in the co connectivity of the pop culture world of, of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to get into those other things and like, take like, let one uh, just kind of go by the wayside for a little bit. You might come back to it later, but like, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah. Like there's so much world to enjoy. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's the thing. Is like I know there's nothing wrong with that, and if this particular operation wasn't in place, I wouldn't give this a second thought. Yeah. But I think of recent times. We're about to lose a lot of listeners with Stitcher leaving. Yeah, we're about to lose mm, a yeah. lot of downloads per month, and I haven't done anything about getting directly onto other platforms, even the microphone. Like you have a, a you know an ace microphone there, Caleb, with with a pop screen. I have the same thing in the other room. Mm -hmm. For four months, I've been saying I'm gonna put I'm gonna find a mount and put it on there and use this for the show. Four months, I haven't done anything. Episodes that get out on the audio, they're always at the end of the month, just so I just because of the lips and billing. You know, there's no yeah. reason that I can't get those out like two three days after once you have a little mm. bit of bandwidth there's no reason i can't do that and you know even like i designed a new comic book bear shirt you know that i was you know, it's been a year it's been a year so it's I, that that's the really frustrating thing is that it affects it affects something else and by that affects you guys because i know we've had a lot of value in being yeah. able to do this every two weeks you know, th mm -hmm. there's a lot of value in that. You know, there's, there's, it's not hyperbole to say that there are times that that's kept me sane in yeah. one context or another. Um, yeah. So I'm just, I hope I get it back. And you know who, you know who might be worth reaching out. And, and I, I say this as a friend, you know, my, my former podcast co host, Craig Lance, um, who you've had on, like, you know, he's your Star Wars buddy and stuff like that. Yeah. I talk to him, you know, I talk to him on a daily basis. I mean, we're still, we're still very close. Um, he probably hasn't read a comic since SFG folded. He's yeah. just, he's not mm -hmm. into it right now. He's watching a lot of shows. He got really into baseball. Um, he kind of did that yeah. thing that we're talking about. Like he just, he put it down and, and walked away. And, you know, I think he'll read something every once in a while, but 
but I think it's okay to do that. I, again, I know, and I know you don't. I know you don't. You're not making the argument that it's not okay or but whatever. No, but, not at all. Um, not at all. But it's, you know, it's it, just it, um, it, it, it just surprising me that it can't even muster enough interest for the bare minimum. Mm. Um, there's a DCBS box coming on Saturday. Yeah. Yay. Um, <laughs> now, uh, and the new order is coming up, and and this was like the first time I said. Why am I doing this? You know, why am I doing this stuff, this stuff to just pile up and pile up? Yeah. Um, so well, sometimes, sometimes people like us, because we are obsessive, we let our hobbies turn into a job. And my husband, I'm just going to bust through the door like the Kool-Aid man because I just said that. And like, look at me. <laughs> but like we do, we let our hobbies turn into a job sometimes. And maybe yeah. that makes it lose its luster. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know. So um, what I've decided to do is I'm not going to make any rash decisions. Um, no, no nuclear option. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to go at least to Co New York Comic Con and see where I'm at. And that was also another thing. You know, for me, Heroes Con was a bust. You know, yeah, to yeah. spend that entire Saturday in the goddamn hotel room uh, until the evening, you know, and some of this could be a bad taste but it started well before that too um and i just i just see you know other people you know like john runyon how excited he is about um comics by night and, and things yeah. that he's and other friends that we have and you know the guys in comic discourse now i can never do that show on an ongoing basis i don't like drilling down to that because i like for me I, I wouldn't have fun doing that on a continued basis on a one-off. Yeah. Um, but that's their thing. And you can tell that they're really enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I need that again. You know, I, I need that for this to work um, or at least for this to work for me. So um, wish me luck, I guess. I don't know, yeah, uh, but I just felt it was something uh, very necessary about, uh, about bringing up. And, you know, if there are listeners, uh, that want to reach out on this uh, on this issue, you know, please do, because um, I I don't think I've been faking it. You know, I'm, I'm, like my opinions about the books are honest that I have covered over the past four or five months. But um, I feel like I'm getting there. I feel like I'm almost there. And Ooh, I, don't want yeah. to be there. I really don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And we've we've always been extremely, you know, pretty clear about our feelings on certain books and when we talk about books it's because we want to talk about them and not just like yeah. ah shit i gotta throw this book the out times there. we've had <laughs> negative talks it's because the the it was such a it was such a negative feeling i mean it was yeah. like oh, <laughs> boy, not poor, you know <laughs> and those are some of our funniest moments too you yeah know? they are La but, and, but and it, especially because it came from like a place of you know excitement to go and read that thing it's like yeah. especially lois lane to the friendship challenge <laughs> i i hate bringing it up because it's one of the worst books i've ever read but you know i i was so excited to read it because i loved what dc was doing with the dc yeah. kids and, DC and i love a lot of before. those other books i Absolutely. love a lot of those other books i still and they're, so they're very often at the top of my stack when there is a new one coming up and we um, we had to read that because it was it was going to be so much fun and then and you know, just, we read it, and it was oh, sad oh. Um, but something that's not sad is we have been joined by Mr. Will Hi, Lindell. Will. Hello, Will. He is. Hello. Um, Bears, he says. Hello, Will. Looking dapper in your Um, your We Facebook may profile. extend a slightly by one day belated happy birthday to Mr. Will yes. Lindell. It was his birthday yesterday. <laughs> happy belated birthday. birthday, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I absolutely, if there's, um, you know, listeners or viewers that would like to reach out to Bill and maybe, you know, they might have their own story and they may have, they yeah. may have something that turned them around, yeah. you know, yeah. but, uh, something that reignited something, or they may have had just a, a different calibration and in their interest, you know, shrunk to something that's manageable. And that's another thing is like, this yeah. is manageable. manageable. Yeah. Manageable is yeah. a good way of putting it. I like, like the I like CBS the, box manageable. <laughs> I like the fact that we can be honest about it though. Like we have the kind of relationship where we can talk to each other. But, I mean, there's been weeks where I've read two books specifically. So I have two books to talk about yeah. for this show. Right. Like, and it's again, like you said, it's not phoning and it's not faking it, but just wasn't in the mood to sit down with it. I'm reading a novel. I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm listening to music. I'm watching a television show. I'm spending time with my husband. I'm spending time with the dogs. There's, there's things that we do. Right. 
I, I think sometimes, like, especially those of us who are, I'm going to use the word quasi-professional, right? Like we do a podcast. We are at least, we've been in this long enough. We know a bunch of industry people. Um, Bill, you've written and, you know, and helped do things. Like, so I, I like the term quasi-professional um, in the comics industry. I think sometimes we present things as like a keeping up appearances thing. Like we have to show our buddies that we're reading as far like a, you know, like, like to, to make sure that they know that we're still in the tribe or something like that mm -hmm. to prove a point or just to, to, you know, to, to maybe defend our spot in our own little geek culture. And we really don't have to, you know, we, no. we really don't. Um, it, it can, it can just be a hobby. You know, it can just be something that we do like to talk to our friends. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's, that's what we all got into it for. And maybe that's that's what I think as adults and it's not chasing nostalgia, it, but it is chasing um, that sense of connection to something that that one that, that childlike wonder or just the un, uh, unwrapping of uh, like a visual fiction mm -hmm. that gave us that much joy. And it brought us to conversations with friends and it gave us a community, especially those of us who grew up nerds. And we really didn't have that in our day to day life. Um, mm -hmm. I know that's not the same thing for everyone, but yeah. Um, I think Caleb, I think we've had, we've had conversations about this, that, yeah. you know, for me, you know, I had plenty of friends to go out and see movies with yeah. and go to concerts, but with. not to talk comics, comics with. was always a yep. very solitary. Exactly. Me, me Even too. when I did get a few friends that read in college, it was still a very solitary thing. And that may have just been like a hangover Yeah. from, uh, from what, and you know, also like fandom was different then. Yeah. Um, you know, I went to one pop culture convention, let's put it that way. And when, when I was in senior year of high school, I'm going up an escalator and there's a guy dressed as some fucking thing. I have no idea what. And I had a denim jacket and it had like, you know, buttons of bands like the Who. Right. And the stuff. I see you wear medals. Are you a warrior? And I was like, oh, fuck that. No. <laughs> yeah no yeah no i can't do that i'm not one of those yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm with you on that. No, no no but but for us too i mean no. there's that extra added layer of not only was it hard to find comic book friends it's hard to find gay or queer comic book friends like mm -hmm. it's even harder finding that niche group of a niche group and yeah. and i like i you know if if i read one book a week two books a week no books a week whatever like i will always cherish the fact that it brought me to some of my closest friends and brought me inside a bubble of people that i would not have otherwise um, yeah. you know sitting here talking to somebody from north carolina and new jersey while i'm sitting in arkansas and it's you know 9:30 at night and 75 billion degrees outside <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I love that, right? Like I'm never like, so I, I, I literally a heat warning was just issued. It popped up on my screen down there. Oh, um, geez. but like, like, I, <laughs> you know, I, I love that. And I, in where I'm at right now, like I said, I'm not, I'm not at the burnout stage, but it is okay just to like chill and relax. Yeah. And I can just talk to my friends and I can focus more on the people that I talk to more so than yeah. the things that I read. And I think Will, uh, William Lindis just made a really good point in the chat. He um, did, and I'm going to pull it up here, actually. Um, so Will Lindis, of course, part of the Movie Bears podcast. Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, media burnout is real. Interestingly enough, the last month or so, uh, he's been seeing one to two movies a week for the podcast and reading 50 comics per week. So that's where mm -hmm. his pendulum has swung. And it's it's yeah. very interesting because, uh, you know, that, you know, for, for those of us who are pursuers of the geeky arts, uh, you know, whether you're a movie fan, a comic book fan, um a novel fan fantasy you know genre mm -hmm. uh fan um tv uh you know enthusiast there's there's moments i mean that we all have where we're a little bit overwhelmed or we've already we've done what we're interested in um except for maybe a few things here or there and it gives us time and permission to redirect our interests a little bit more and maybe find something new or find something that we haven't been pursuing for a while. Um, and, it, you know, going back to what I had mentioned about, like, the reasons why people sometimes go through these these moments where they're like, or these parts of their lives where they're like, well, this thing that I'm really passionate about, I, I you know, I need to kind of put that aside a little bit or, you know, mostly, maybe not 100%, but like 90%. And focus on something else or find something else that, you know, that can make me happy. And this is always there. <laughs> you know the comics are always there the comics are still being published people are still going to be publishing comics they've the industry has collapsed i don't know how many times in the past 90 years and <laughs> 90 on forever. 
<laughs> no one will ever no one will ever read comics again because you know it's a completely useless yeah. medium and all you know whatever there's always something there and like you know caleb and 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 bill i've talked about this before like i was reading comics constantly uh up until like high school and then high school i stopped reading most comics but it was sandman who kind of kept me in the loop there and it was only Sandman. Like, i was only reading sandman yeah. Um I, I had no now, idea what was going on. With with Dave Morrison's else. JLA. I was only reading that. Yeah, only yeah. reading Sam. And then, you know, in college, I was only picking up, you know, really interesting, very autobiographical or artistic indie comics that I would just find randomly in bookstores if I could find them in English. And it was just it was just something that I would find and I'm like, this looks amazing and interesting. I'm gonna read it because I know the value of comics and graphic art for storytelling yeah. whereas somebody else who maybe didn't have a background in comics would have been just like whatever you know it's pictures funny you know funny books whatever but that just kind of it was there it was always there even while i was like you know constantly in movie festivals or constantly watching anime or fan subbing shit and uh you know whatever i could always kind of like oh there's a I don't know. There's there's uh, cages by Dave McKean. That looks really cool. Let me yeah. flip through that and yeah, have my mind. And maybe right maybe you just need a palate. I mean, uh, and, and maybe you don't. I mean, there's nothing that you actually need to do. But I mean, maybe sometimes it's a palate cleanser for something that you know yeah. is is what we need. Um, you know, I mean, that's just. I just I want to be excited about this stuff again, yeah. and it's just I can't seem to generate enthusiasm. Genuine generate genuine enthusiasm don't say that 10 times quick <laughs> yeah, so we'll see how things play out but yeah. you know again i'm glad we had this discussion and you know again for anybody who is listening that might want to provide some feedback if they had similar situations i'd be interested in hearing it even if it's Absolutely. not advice that i'd walk away from or a description of a situation that i can sympathize with it, it, it's still interesting to hear what other people have gone through like this oh yeah all right we've cut into a lot of time we always do so <laughs> let's get to some comics and steve i think out of the ones we're talking about you probably have the most marquee value one up top oh right god of you. Yeah. he is the flag you and talking about passion and passion for books and passion for um you know entire franchises i think x-men fans tend to be pretty passionate about things um, oh, we just had somebody uh, join us, Robin Clyde, uh, joining Hello. us on YouTube. Hello, Robin. Um, and you know, X Men is is a pretty big deal for a lot of people. I mean, we've we've had so many reinventions over the past, I don't know, five decades of them. <laughs> ninety days, um, yeah, or or in the past, you know, ninety <laughs> days or the past, you know, three three volumes of X Men that have come out in the past three years. Um, it's just, you know, whenever there's a massive X event, it becomes a really big deal for Marvel, especially, but also, you know, fans of comics and fans of, say, the X-Men. Um, that leads us to The Fall of X, which I've been talking about a couple, you know, a couple books here and there. It's, you know, it's been coming up, the sort of the supposed true end of the Hickman era, Krakoan era X-Men is upon us. And, uh, you know, we need to prepare for this. It's happening. Uh, and so we've had several, like, one-shots that have come out over the past uh, couple of months. Um, I've talked about a couple of them here. Uh, but it was all kind of, like, leading up to this book that just came out last week, um, the last Wednesday in July. And that is the Hellfire Gala 2023 book. And I'm going to throw that up on screen. I have... Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of you may have noticed I have the poster of that issue behind me. I was able to find that. Um, and as you can see, it's, you know, like every year, like the past several years that they've had a Hellfire Gala filled with beautiful and or questionable fashion for the X-Men and attendees of the Hellfire Gala. You can see some examples here on the cover. Um, but essentially, it's an excuse to get all of the major X-Men together and have them drawn as like back man char background characters or foreground characters or have, you know, major announcements. 
Um, and this is no uh, no different, except the first major announcement happens. And by the way, just so everybody understands, I'm going to spoil the hell out of this book. Um, if it hasn't already been spoiled for you on every single website that deals with comics over the past week, I'm going to spoil the crap out of it. Um, it opens with number one spoiler, uh, Miss Marvel. Guess what? She's a mutant. Yay. She died and she came back because she's a mutant so they could bring her back. So, so Miss Marvel's a mutant now. Um, yeah, so she's what, not dead, which was was that? Huge, that was a huge controversy. Okay, as somebody who's been a... Why is it a huge controversy? Jesus Christ. Well, they um, killed her off in yeah. Amazing Spider-Man. And yeah. she was killed off in a book that wasn't even her own. But she, she doesn't was, have a uh, regular title. I know, she doesn't have a regular title. She was just sort of like, you know, yeah. a side character in that adventure uh, and ended up getting killed off. But killed off in a way that was just sort of like... Uh, was I a hero? Tell me I was a hero, Peter. Was I a hero before I die? You know, that kind of, like, melodramatic dynasty bullshit. Um, and so it was kind of out of character a little bit. Uh, and that kind of pissed everybody off. It's like, yeah. why are you going to kill off the number one, yeah. like, Muslim character that Marvel has as one of the most popular characters mm -hmm. of the past 10, 15 years? You know, why would you do that? The one this thing I was wondering, though, there was some kind of line about she went to the top of the list, though. Yes. The, so yeah. they was specifically it, was it simply wanted because her... of the the inhuman um, mutant. No. So okay, because that that wasn't very so what's, clear on that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's been happening, of course, in the other X titles is Orcus, the big you know human ish. Um, you know, organizations been trying to destroy the mutants this whole time, um, have been really making a bad PR mess. And, you know, hey, X-Men haven't been really helping themselves in that arena either. Um, but what they found out when they found out that Miss Marvel was a mutant and she died, they were like, we got to bring this girl back because people love her in, you know, the world of, you know, the comics, but also like in general. But people love her. And so if we kind of like slowly reveal that, guess what? She's been a mutant this whole time. People might, I guess, like mutants again. I don't know. The questionable, questionable. But they do bring Miss Marvel back. So we do get Kamala again, which is nice. Um, and she, of course, finds out that she's a mutant. And, you yeah. know, I'm sure she's going to be having a great time. I don't know how she's going to have a great time after what happens in this book. But, you know. Uh, she's back alive, so I guess that's good. Um, the other thing that's uh, that's kind of interesting in this is, of course, we have the beautiful Hellfire Gala itself that looks gorgeous and uh, fantastic, and everybody's in attendance. Um, and then, of course, all hell breaks loose, and we actually also have good old Dr. Stasis showing up, um, you know, with Karima, or Kalima, uh, if everybody's a fan of... Um, Temple of Doom, because every time she shows up, it's just death, 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 death. Um, they have decided that they're going. Orcus is going to crash the Hellfire Gala, and um, immediately does so by killing off several big mutants right away. Dazzler dies. Uh, let's see. Dazzler Bobby. dies. Cannonball dies. Jubilee gets her head smushed um, by Nimrod. Um, Bobby. Oh yeah. Uh, Nimrod stabs him with some kind of like reverse melty yeah. matrix. And so he melts in front of his boyfriend. Mean. Oh, tragic. Um, but she becomes just lots of, yeah, some, yeah, lots of, lots of death, 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 death. Um, ju you know, juggernaut who's now, you know, kind of become a good guy again and was just about to be an X-Men. He tries to, you know, to fight Nimrod off. And of course, you know, tragic end there as well. I, Potentially, he may be dead. I have a question about that. And this is sure. my ignorance of the X-Men. Since when is Juggernaut a mutant? Why is he Juggernaut there? Juggernaut has never been a mutant. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Why is he there? He's not a yeah. mutant. He's powered by a crystal. Yeah, he's like, yeah you know. He's like the, the original... Um, you know, Tesla. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Namor kind of mutant. Yeah, yeah he's I, kind I, of like a, yeah. you know, unofficial. He's 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 yeah. definitely he's like been led into the group basically. Like, I mean, yeah. I mean I get like nepotism, yeah. like it's, it's his brother, but like yeah. He's not a mutant, right? Yeah. Yeah. But he's, yeah, I mean he's I guess he is now. 
yeah, I now maybe. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of vague, and I know there's been some other stuff in some of the other books. Um, you always get back to that out, you, that argument with Deadpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and or, or Wanda, you know, I mean, that's that's a good recent yeah. example too. Because she wasn't, well. she is, she's not, she was, yeah. she is. It's a religion, it's not, it's a thing. But who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and Nightcrawler is Spider Man now, so that's so it's all okay. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so all these disastrous, horrible things are happening. People are, you know, heroes are dying left and right. The Avengers have been called away on, you know, on a ruse. Same thing with Scott. He was called away on a ruse and severely injured. Um, But I think one of the good saving graces here, of course, is that Rogue, being part of the Avengers now, a literal card-carrying Avenger, uh, was also called away before everything went to insane shit. And besides just Dr. Stasis and Karima and Nimrod, who else shows up, but also Psycho Moira is back. And uh, she essentially holds a knife to Charles' throat and says, guess what? We've taken control of all of your uh, all of your gates. You need to order every single mutant, wherever they are on the planet, to go through those gates and never return to Earth. Ever. And also, um, all of like those cures and medicines that you've been uh, peddling to humans for the past three years. Well, we've had our good friend Modok here make them all poison so we can actually kill everybody who's ever taken them. Okay. Uh, if, you know, if any more mutants show up on Earth, if we see yeah. any more mutants, we're going to immediately like kill everybody who's taken. And uh, uh, also, the, there's mutants. that dialogue if, if they revive a mutant, a uh, human dies. If they revive exactly. a second unit, 10 humans die. Uh, Which, all I can, that, I can but... give them a list of some people like here. <laughs> it's like take, put yeah, these on the top go. of the list to, to exchange for that. Go. Like, but, well, uh, give us fifteen, you you take this population. Go, absolutely. Uh, just just yeah. such a great idea. Wait, uh, is is, is that going to happen before or after we find out what goes on with the indictments? <laughs> <laughs> well, in this in this world, presumably uh, Trump was never president, so <laughs> who knows? Um, but King but, uh, but yeah. Just absolute, you know, absolute insanity. Mm. Everybody, you know, it's bleak, 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 bleak. Jean gets stabbed and presumably killed. But before she does, she lodges herself in Dr. Stasis's mind, takes Firestar's consciousness and says, Firestar, we're going to make you our mole inside Orgus. We're going to make it so that you've always been part of Orgus. And Dr. Stasis has brought you on as his, like, accomplice this entire time. And you'll save us all somehow, I'm sure. Um, and uh, and then she disappears. She says goodbye to everybody and goes away. Mystique gets thrown to the thrown off a cliff and smashes against rocks, possibly dead. Um, just everybody, you're like, whatever. And then Charles has to basically order almost everybody, except for those who can resist him and escape, uh, into the gates, and they just march into the gates without questioning. Um, and uh, thankfully, Rogue shows up, smashes Moira to pieces, but clearly doesn't kill her because if they did, all time would reset. Uh, so you know, just smashes her to pieces, and I guess leaves the head somewhere because she's a an android. Uh, and rescues Charles to take him to Krakoa Pacific because Krakoan Island itself has also been stolen. Anything, anyone who is still on Krakoa, the actual island of Krakoa, has been stolen by uh, Mother, oh gosh, what is her name? Uh, Mother Righteous, who is the other sinister clone person, um, now has all of their souls, and so she's wandered off to God knows where. Um, So it's just a big, massive mess, and so Rogue is there, deposits Charles on the Krakoa island and says, Charles, what are we going to do now? At which point... Um, oh, and here's here's uh, you know Jubilee getting her head smashed uh, just mm-hmm. because why not? Um, there's Bobby getting melted, you know, <laughs> again because why not? Um, and then wait, there's this. Wait, this can we go back to where Cena Grace is dating Bobby? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Cena with a little bit more hair on I top. Mean, man. I, I don't know. Looks girl got good. a witch hook. What's it? What's oh, a, yeah. What was that guy's name? Like Rory or something or? Uh, oh gosh, I think name. it started with an M. I, I know he had yeah, a, it has a name. his name. It's so um, and maybe we'll find out more about that in the uh, book, the Iceman book. I think it's Astonishing Iceman that's I coming out. Romeo. Yes, thank you, Will. It is Romeo. Um, so yeah, so just tragic, tragic, tragic. Everybody's die, 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 die. Kingpin's <laughs> there for a reason. 
I don't know. Kingpin's I, there uh, at some point and becomes like a new ally for everybody. Okay, cool. Um, but then, of course, there's this you know this page where Rogue has saved Professor X, um, and just basically says, "Charles, where are all the mutants? Where'd you order them to?" In the gates. And Chuck at this point is like, "Oh shit! I never asked where the gates were going." I think they're all dead. They probably like ported them out, out to outer space and they're all dead somewhere. And so, of course, he's having his own crisis as well. Okay, so all of this happens. This is like everything that you can possibly have as a horrific tragedy, which, by the way, the X-Men have had constantly over the past several years. Yeah, Every time ending. they have to go and reboot things. I mean, I was talking about Age of X before we got on here. That was the last time where basically everybody got, you know, completely booted into some other alternate reality where there were no more humans and everybody was a mutant and, and everything had been changed. Uh, and then, of course, Powers of X and uh, House, uh, Powers of Ten and House of X, uh, where it turns out that everything's been re re rebooted about 10 times, <laughs> 11 times. Um, so, yeah, it, did they kill everybody off for real? Probably not. They might be in stasis somewhere, uh, you know, in some big, um, some big holding tank in the sky. Who knows? Um, especially because there are lots of ongoing titles and lots of new titles. Miss Marvel's getting a new title. Iceman's getting a title. Didn't he just melt? I don't know. I guess not. Um, we've got Jean Grey coming back somehow for the upcoming wedding between, uh, you know, Emma Frost and Tony Stark, which is coming up in a couple months. Like. For the absolute end of X-Men, it seems that there are quite a few that are still around and are going to be kicking around trying to, you know, trying to bring things back. So um, is this a pretty bombastic way to start uh, the new phase of the X-Men? Ah, sure. Absolutely. Um, did I really enjoy this title? Eh. Yeah, eh. that was my feeling. It was it was so over the top. Yes, and the body count was so high. When you marry that with the first eighteen, nineteen pages of the story, which are kind of joyous, yeah, um, absolutely, you know, it really was not very well conceived. That that's what yeah, I came off with it. Um, I, it this might have worked at like maybe a if this was split into two different issues. Yeah, it may have been a little more effective. Um, but, you know, when you get to these stories, you know, it's just, it, you know, this is something that Marvel does, I think, too much. It's like, you know, can't you give Matt Murdock a good day? You know, can't yeah. you, you, you know, can't you give these guys, they, you know, they, they found a system that worked. It's still tragedy ahead from, but does it have to be sweeping like this? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. can't you know just the thing about like the the you know the the Krakoan pharmaceuticals? What if that was a sl a slow burn and people you know mm -hmm. that's that's a more interesting story to me than Modok yeah. flipping a switch, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I'm sure there's stuff in the grand scheme of things that is going to be very well executed, but it was. Just like a Hellfire Gala would be in real life, it was too much. It was too much. It was, it was girl, too. girl. It was way over the top. Girl. Well, and, too extra. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't read this issue, right? So, I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I've still got them stacked up back in that closet back there, and I'll, I'll get to them, you know, fairly quickly now that I'm actually reading monthlies again. But, like, <laughs> I, I mean, yes, is this like to, to, to borrow Bill's phrase, is it ill-conceived? Yes. But is it unexpected? Like this is what always yeah. happens. And, and to be fair, I think it always happens for two reasons. Number one, it's low hanging fruit. It, it, it's easy. Yep. It's easy pickings to, to make it happen, but also because the mutants work best when they're a minority, right? Like they, like they work best when they are having like their whole shtick is the fact that they but are having how to many times do we need to see that? To me, I, I don't, that's, you know, that's the thing. I, it's like, to me, no. it's more the integration of them into society is much more interesting than them always being the outsiders. No, and, and I agree We've with had that. had enough of that. 
No, I, I do agree with that. The thing is, they were not being integrated in society. They were launched well, yeah. up and they, they went over and they became a superpower overnight. Like this whole thing, and I've said this from the beginning since, since you know, Hickman kind of conceived this idea. This mm -hmm. is a retread of the um, Asteroid M island out in San Francisco, except Hickman made it Israel, right? Like it is a metaphor for Israel. And it became a nuclear superpower overnight, stuck in the middle of something and disrupted an entire thing. And it was going to be blowback. And we see, like, I think that there's, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, right? But there's a large metaphor for this. And it was always going to come back and loop in to talk about those things. It's not surprising. And, and then when you factor in the 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 politics of, of all of this and the idea that, um, the, these characters, the X-Men, right? Like uh, all the superheroes, all of these characters that Marvel and DC did, they were never supposed to last 80 years, right? They were never supposed to go this <laughs> long. They were, they were, they were always, they were conceived and conceptualized as being this, this kind of of the moment stories that were disposable to wrap up and put in your back pocket. They were never supposed to last this long. And so when you build this, this fundamental, um, uh, metaphor into the mutants, right? Like, are they really the thing if they're not the thing? And and can can we get, like? I mean, I know that's I know that's boiling it down into simplistic terms, but are they really the X Men if they are not battling for that position? And how long can you ride that? You know, mm -hmm. they they tried to make something different with the Inhumans, and they tried to make something different with Araco, and they still let the X Men ad nauseum take charge of that. I don't know that it can work any other way and still be the X-Men, right? Like, yeah. Well, I, I think also it because is, it, but I don't know that it can, I'm not getting paid to write the shit. So <laughs> yeah. no. So Jerry Duggan is uh, in this case. Um, and yeah, he, he threw everything, including the kitchen sink and the kitchen sinks clone into this. Um, and also, if you take a look at the artist page on here, I'm just going to do a quick readout. And I have to say, I did love the artwork, the, you know, some really beautiful designs here. A lot of design. Oh, Dazzler's all costume. of these costumes. Oh, oh I love that. Costume. Her oh, costume this time. Yeah. I loved it. Loved it. I, the only one that I, I wasn't a big fan I of. Hate to be the artist that has to draw that again and again and again. But, oh uh, yeah. Well, they probably won't because it was just a one time. She's yeah. dead. So it doesn't matter. We'll never see her again. So. That outfit died. <laughs> she did, and she'll be yeah, back. The outfit is dead. <laughs> Hated it. <laughs> She's gonna be wearing pajamas next time. Um. But basically, we've got Adam Kubert, Luciano Vecchio, Matteo Loli, Russell Dowderman, of course, Javier Pins, R.B. Silva, uh, Josh Cazera, Chris Anka, Pepe Larraz. Um, and then, of course, for the color artists, we've even got a huge lineup of colorists, too. Um, Rain Barredo, Ceci De La Cruz, Matt Wilson, Erica Arthaniega, and Marte Gracia as well. So there's just, it has just been like, it. Everybody who is everyone at Marvel has just been kind of you know working on this book. So yeah, um, they did a beautiful job. It is a beautiful book, and if if you want to get your eight ninety nine worth, you know definitely throw it at this one. Um, if you have not been reading X Men, or if you have been like me and letting them pile up for the past six months, and you have real no uh, no idea what's been going on, this is really hard to recommend because yes. this book basically if you don't have any knowledge of what's been going on up to this point this book make will make zero sense to you so i'm thinking and, that, and that's a shame because it should have been a, a yeah. jumping on point and there was no it reason to jumping on point you know but i think that maybe have this, a news the, you know have a news person yeah. describing what the hellfire gala is perfect yeah perfect landscape to provide that you know but I think maybe the books that, that spin out of this might be good jumping on points for people yeah. because then we're starting out with the new status quo of the X-Men on the run from the world again. Uh, the rebirth to, of X. Yeah, trying to trying to survive while everyone hates them. So The renaissance yeah, of X. Might be good. The, to, to Linda's point, I mean, we're also getting the Hickman Skeety Gods launch uh, that's going to be coming oh, yeah. that too. So, I mean, other things are Yeah, that was there. an interesting... Yeah, as Will mentions here, the page that threw me off was the Hickman Skeety page setting up the gods. And that's yeah. that's right. There was a, basically one page where two characters uh, were having a conversation there with Magic and um, essentially talking about, you know, gods. That's uh, And then they walk I, off. 
that had yeah. no I, I didn't understand that had no bearing on the rest of the story. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, that's it's what, just that's what William said. He said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what that was. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, right. hey, just yeah, before we move on, because I didn't I, gotta think, I didn't think Hickman was credited on the issue. Did no, you? he's not. Yeah, okay. He's he's not, no, no. Uh, just yeah. just as a point of personal privilege, I just got a notification that my niece Kerrigan is watching. So, hey, baby. <laughs> Kerrigan, uh, the, Hello, my, Kerrigan. Uh, my Hello. oldest niece, uh, the 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 young woman whose name is, is tattooed across my back. So, uh, she's like the daughter I, I don't have. So, hey, hey, kiddo. That's all right. Cool. Well, that is cool. She's watching. You should take the mic, and we probably should stick with Marvel. So, talk about the book that you've got, Caleb. Yeah. So, um, I like like Bill said, we're going to stay in the Marvel wheelhouse. I'm going to take us over from the X Men um, to the other title that is more of like my foundation for superhero comics, uh, and that is the Avengers. But it's not Avengers proper. We're going to talk about Avengers Beyond, um, and this book it. it it was interesting. It was fun. I, I wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. It was kind of a throwaway title, um, but it took me for a little bit of a ride. So, I, like, I wanted to talk about it. So, um, this book is before you by... get going. Can I just tell you how much I love the the, the credits or Landy Land? Yes, yes, Landy. I've been saying Landy Land. <laughs> Sorry, read this. You're not the only one. Um, Landy Land Armada. Da, da, so da, da, da. this book is, as as Bill said, it's written by Derek Landy. It's drawn by uh, by Greg Land. Jay Leasting uh, does the inks. Uh, Frank Diarmada is the colors, and Joe Caramanga does the letters. Um, I just want to say first and foremost, because I know people have a, a a reaction, whether whether good, bad, or otherwise, to the phrase Greg Land, right? Yes, Greg Land drew this book. Yes, it is what you can expect from Greg Land. He's using, obviously, photo reference, mostly from Pornhub, although now, I, who knows if he's going to, like, Pornhub's getting cracked down on, so who, who, who knows if that'll last. But um, I've been doing the thing, and I spoke a little bit about this earlier. Like, to Bill's point, I reached a point to where, like, the monthly comics, reading these books as they come out, trying to keep up with them, wasn't doing it for me, right? Like, I read too much, and I can't remember what happens from month to month. So I was like, hey... Let me let me build this up. Let me let these things sit and and marinate for a little bit. I'll I'll save them up. I'm still supporting monthly comics, but I'll do it. So I binged this week after letting them build up all five issues of this, um, and it was fun. It very much capitalizes off of the end of Jason Aaron's Avengers, kind of this era. And so, long story short, right? Like I'm not going to walk you through five issues. I'll just give you the broad overview, thirty thousand foot view. Um, the Avengers are doing their thing. It's Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, She-Hulk, and they're just avenging. They're doing their thing, and they start to realize that, hey, like, something's happening. Like, we keep forgetting things, and, like, we're, we get put in places that we don't know what's going on. What's going, what's, what, like, things aren't adding up, and then all of a sudden, at the same time, T'Challa and Tony are like, this feels like a Beyonder thing. It's a Beyonder thing. The Beyonder's doing the Beyonder thing, and Lo and behold, that's what happens, and the Beyonder is narrating the entire story. Um, and so the Beyonder comes comes back into the Marvel Universe and is just manipulating things, mostly for his own gain, because what's happened here is the Beyonder is a little bit scared. He's afraid. There is a being um, that is, uh, his his former name is Cal Hora, but he's, he's largely just known as the Lost One, right? This is the celestial being that the Beyonders powers came from the Beyonders as a group, as an, a, a, a race. I don't know like what they actually are, but they stole their power from this, this, this creature, this, this guy. And he wants his power back. He's a little upset about this. And so he's been going through and just kind of killing Beyonders, taking his power back. And so main Beyonder, the Beyonder that we know from the Marvel proper is just kind of running for his life. And so what is he going to do? He's going to go to the heroes, right? Like, Makes sense. And so he goes and, and he is trying to manipulate things on Earth to get them to draw this this the Lost One's attention. But it's not working out. But once Tony and T'Challa realize what's happening, they pull the Beyonder into the world, right? Which means that he's they can like the, the Lost One can sense his power. He can see him and he's making a beeline for Earth. Um what inevitably happens is the Beyonder's like, all right, well, he's coming after me now. We gotta make a make a plan here's a better plan for a world shield, right? Like just for straight out of the MCU, like we're going to put a shield around the world to protect it. Homeboy shows up, 
there's a battle like he 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 co-ops the black order for a little bit which i'm a huge black order fan i love the call obsidian like when they show up i'm happy um so he co-ops them for a little bit there's another warrior princess named tiamak who's running amok and doing all kinds of murdery things on earth and she's a great design but a little bit of a villain um her and she hulk and and captain uh, marvel have some amazing fights they're duking it out but things line up to where they get this shield online and the lost one shows up at that moment right and he can't get in but all of a sudden things go bad like the his, the little side creatures uh, you know the side party start breaking down the shield and he gets in lo and behold it's the beyonder doing some shady shit right what has happened is Beyonder this whole time has been doing this through his machinations has not been using the shield to keep the lost one out. He's made a trap of the, of the earth, right? Like he set it to where once the lost one goes into earth shield goes back up, he's stuck there for eternity. The world's going to die, but Hey, the universe and the rest of the beyonders are safe. Just generally shady. You know, what do you expect with the guy from that big of shoulder pads? Um, it's just kind of weird. This does not fly with the Avengers, though. They're not having it. They've got a plan. Um, they they actually work the Beyonder against himself. Of course, by the end of it, the day is saved. Um, as Steve was so nice to throw this cover up, my favorite part about this book are the bootleg Avengers. Um, through machinations of the Beyonder, he has made uh, there was a there was a creature that was living on Earth in exile she made everybody around her get superpowers and the beyonder manipulated them and thinking they were the Avengers. So then you just get the bootleg Avengers <laughs> and it's hilarious. Um, you also get um, yonder, the <laughs> yonder, the fake beyonder or the bootleg beyonder who is uh, an, an aspect of beyonders memories. Again, I'm not going to spoil it for you. You can go read this story. You can figure out how they save the day. It's very lowbrow, it, like, but to me, this was surprisingly a kind of a palate cleanser that I needed because I didn't care for Jason Aaron's Avengers. I'm not the world's biggest Greg Land fan by any means. I don't particularly pick any book up that he's on. I don't ignore it, though. He, he just is what he is. A book like this, it pays off because he plays into the photo reference stuff. And so it, the art makes sense. And it's just it's 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 sticky. It's funny. It was a good time. I found myself laughing out loud very, very uh, often while I was reading this book. Landy gets, I, I will say, as far as us talking about continuity of these characters, Landy gets it, man. He writes a great, uh, great Tony. He writes a really good T'Challa. Um, his She-Hulk is on point. It was just really, really fun. To me, it was a great end cap to what's going on from not only the Avengers, but also from... Um, uh, from the be not the Beyonders book, but there was another book that was drawn. Um, I can't even think of what it is now. Um, that took place in outer space, and you get like Thanos's mom is hanging out. It's uh, the Defenders, but in space. This kind of spills that's, out about that. Yeah, that's what I was I was going to ask about, like how you know where this fits in with Defenders Beyond. Th this this that, spills out of that, right? Okay, so so, so like uh, Galactus's mom and um, they're not in Marvel this book, and but they're not at all. Yeah, yeah, they're not in this book at all. But the Beyonder does come out because they like there's some Beyonder stuff in that story, right? So th this loops into yeah. that. So it was a fun story. The art was serviceable. It's Greg Land. You know what? The thing is, oh, like him or hate him, you know froze. what you get when you get Greg Land. Oh no! Oh, am I back? Okay, we. You Caleb never is experiencing me. some. Okay. Oh yeah, it just heard it was, oh, it was frozen here yeah yeah so okay greg land did that yeah it is the ghost of greg land coming back to haunt us but it, look he's dependable <laughs> you know what you're gonna get with greg land um greg landy continues to impress this is not his first book that i've read of him super fun he knows the marvel universe so just a really dumb fun comics right like it, the the comedy was there it, it, it was it was funny it was lighthearted. it was adventurous Reminds you why these heroes are heroes uh, in, in this world. So <laughs> I encourage you to go check it out. Again, this is not Hawksbox, right? This is not the Avenger, or not 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 Hickman. This is this is kind of low level stuff, but it's mm -hmm. good superhero comics with some some serviceable art. So I, yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was neat to see how they kind of work together to save the day. And um, again, Yonder is now my new favorite thing. 
<laughs> when you said when you said that, I'm like, what? Is this like a hillbilly version of Beyond? It's like, just where ridiculous this... on the best level. Like it, it, yeah. it makes no sense, and it's awesome. So, um, it's it's what I wanted out of out of this book. And even with the Greg Land of it all, as the, yeah. It, yeah, you had mentioned it's not Hickman. I'm gonna go over to Hickman. There you go. Yeah. So Steve. Oh, you you've got the first, Hickman. There we yeah, go. So if you can put that first graphic up, I know that two issues have come out at this point. I'm only gonna be talking about the first issue, and I know Steve has read this and he has opinions. Uh, so yeah. we're gonna be talking about what appears to be the return of the Ultimate Universe maybe with ultimate invasion number one you'll see that that's the front cover uh it actually is a gatefold and if you see on this end what you have here is the ultimates the classic ultimates lineup with the illuminati and miles and maker on the other part of the cover um, and I think that the Ultimates being present, though they're not present at all in the story, they're very much present in terms of the storytelling. If you had put Millar's name with Hitch here, I wouldn't have batted an eye. This is the least Hickman feeling book I've read in a long time that he's actually credited with. It felt like widescreen Mark Millar brian hitch comics it really did so where are we with ultimate invasion so the story starts off with a break-in at a facility and it's not a bank though there's keys it's where they're holding maker uh and i wasn't aware of all this stuff that went on with that when he got a hold of the symbiote but he seems to like just keep going back to being imprisoned um <laughs> on the planet uh due to the illuminati that are uh, that are pictured there and um maker for people who don't know he is the ultimate version of uh, the ultimate universe version of reed richards who went back to crazy and when the universe died in secret war civil war two right civil war two uh -huh. was that when it went can put no secret secret wars. No, it was secret, secret wars. wars. Yeah, it was Hickman's secret, secret wars. wars. Secret wars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, the, yeah. there is secret a wars three, like maybe a I guess Civil War two with stuff, but I don't even want to yeah. bother trying to remember it. Um, uh, <laughs> where you left off with the with the Ultimate Universe, there were two survivors. One being my uh, one being as you see there in the front. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me maker and the other is miles uh morales and maker decides that he's going to recreate the ultimate universe but first he has to break out of prison and he does this and this was a little convoluted steve maybe you can add some color about accessing the memories of the psychiatrist that went to see him and it, it, that was weird that that was a little hickman-esque um, but the people that he engages to break him out end up becoming toast. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. He turns on them. Uh, so Maker escapes, and he's stealing something from each of the realms or the uh, or the you know facilities that are associated with the Illuminati. There's something stolen from the Baxter building, something stolen from Adelon. And that was, that was a little sad seeing Lockjaw like knocked out. I wasn't happy about that. Um, something stolen from Stark's facility, uh, something from Wakanda, something from Atlantis. So, uh, and uh, one of the most important things, it was a, um, a staff that was taken from the Sanctum Sanctorium. So they're all involved in this. They have to know what happens. And they're going to go after Maker, but he's a few steps ahead of them. Um, and one of the most interesting things, again, as I said, Maker and Miles Morales are the two um, are the two survivors of this universe that have become incorporated into Six One Six. He meets up with Miles, and it's not a battle, though the tension that builds up as they're talking you think it's going to be a big slugfest and this was one of this was one of the best hickman um 
bait and switches. Uh, you just feel this this tension where they're having this conversation about, you know, they were the only two survivors. And then Maker says at, at the end, do you want me to join you? And then, like, Miles just cuts him off. Nah, I'm good. And it's basically the end of their interaction. It was really funny and really cool. In the it's of this very... What you know, as I've always called them, widescreen comics. Now, Steve, if you can just uh, show some of the artwork there, this is Hitch. It, it really is top notch. He's in really good form in this issue. Yeah, that, that's um, so, good. Hitch. Yeah, so you see here, you have the Illuminati, um, and they were talking. This is just after the break it happened. And then, if you can go over to another issue, just before, um, uh, just before Maker accesses one of the stolen gates that was hidden on Krakoa, um, they all venture to uh, to defeat him. And just a beautiful, beautiful uh, double-page spread. And if um, I should have given you the graphic, but you also have in the back matter some of his pencils, and they're just gorgeous. They're just oh, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so uh, the heroes lose, effectively. You know, Maker mm -hmm. gets away and we end the story, which is supposedly in the present day. And you see a teenage Peter Parker and he's on a visit to a local science lab. And there's a spider that's about to bite him. And then somebody takes the spider, puts it in a test tube and it's Maker. So it looks like we have the new ultimate universe in its formation. Um, I was fine with the issue. I mean, I, it, it definitely felt like an ultimate book. I mean, it definitely had that feel. Um, not one of the better ultimate books, but it did have that, you know, and I, I can't say widescreen comics again. I just can't say it. It's, but, you know, that just that big blockbuster feel. Though the action wasn't necessarily to the level that I would associate something like ultimates with, you know, it, we haven't gotten, and, and again, it's the first issue. We haven't gotten to the, the death defying, you know, life threatening plateau that you, you know, you were going to get to, but as a mechanism for kickstarting something again, I, it might work. Um, but um, it wasn't, like I said, it, it did feel like a Mark Millar book, but I did feel that some of the screws can have been a little tighter. Yeah, and, and Steve, I know you've read yeah. this, so I was wondering what you felt. So I, yeah, so I did read this, and I also read the next issue, the latest issue that came out. Um, and it, you know, it is, it's basically restarting, very similar to how Marvel Six One Six Universe was restarted after Secret Wars, where. Reed Richards and Franklin and basically, and I guess molecular man uh, went and reseeded the universe with, you know, what things should be makers trying to do the same thing himself. He's trying to reseed a new universe with the way that he thinks it should be. Um, and I like that idea. I like the, the idea of like a psychotic, insane, super genius who is a horrific villain and is, you know, essentially tried to annihilate all life multiple times, uh, decides that he wants to create the perfect version of Earth, and he has the way of doing it. The The way that they set it up in the first issue, I, I like it. I, I it, am not it, a big fan it, of the It came Maker. right out of the gate. There's no build-up. Yes, they, was like, there was no, like, yeah. there was no, like, okay, we're gonna plant the seeds and it really is, see them, you know, you know, see them fruit. It's like, no, 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 no. We're just, like, all that got taken care of off camera. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all off camera. You're, you're good. And then, uh, you know, here it is. I I thought the um, the jailbreak was pretty clever. The heist movie in reverse. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. You're you're breaking me out, but you're still in here. And then he <laughs> merges all the people together into one big version of himself that he leaves there so that everybody thinks that he's still imprisoned. Um, that was pretty gross. And pretty I should have mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> that was a, that was a good bit of body horror, and yeah. I thought they did that. A really, you know, Hitch did a, a good job of making it look gross in the John Carpenter's The Thing kind of way. Yeah. Um, but having it also make sense. Um, the Miles discussion, like that conversation, I was expecting to go in a very different direction. So yeah, I mean, that was a an interesting Hickman 
bait and switch scene, maybe? I mean, I, I really was expecting something a little bit more bombastic to come out of that. But... Especially with him cover featured. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But here's, yeah. I mean, and, and just so you know, Miles isn't featured anywhere in issue two, but that could also possibly just be setting it up that he's going to be the only one who can help the 616 heroes or whoever, uh, you know, get maker or defeat maker. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, is it the most exciting thing that I've, I've read? No, but it, and, and I know you were talking about like wide screen. Well, <laughs> not narrow, not four by three, not four, three comics. Uh, it is larger comics. Um, but I felt like there was a little bit of restraint here. Yeah. Um, you know, Which is there was, I'm there was a little where bit. it felt like, you know, that's where I was saying with the fine tuning, it was, yeah. You know, the it was almost like a, an engine that wasn't fully tuned up. Yeah, like the, yeah. there was something that could, could have from, initially. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, from the outside, yeah, I, from the outside looking in, not having read this issue, it's just weird for me to see Hickman like go back to something because normally yeah. Hickman's like, "I've done this." And I'm done with it. And I'm, and I'm going to move it. Yeah, on. like his stuff always built together. Like his Fantastic Four built into his Avengers, built into Secret Wars, right? But like it's it's weird for me to see him like go backwards and like like walk over ground he's already covered. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, that might. I don't have any sense this is going to tie into gods. I don't okay. Have any sense of that? Yeah. That, it, it, yeah. So that was strange for me. Could, to you know, I've, who knows I've got them. I just haven't read them. But so. Yeah. Which I'm all, I, like. I like the maker. He's a fun character. I like. I like all of these characters. So it's. I'm cool to. I'm glad they're going back to it. But my only problem with Maker is that Evil Re Richards has already been done better. Yeah, and that's yeah. Hank Henshaw, Cyborg Superman. Yeah. Well, and also, and I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it again. Like that's a literal translation. That's the DC version of Reed Richards. And the evil Reed Richards right there is Hank, uh, Hank Crenshaw. But also in terms of heroic character in an alternate universe coming out and being the ultimate evil that's going to destroy all life in the universe. That man who laughs. And I think with... And this is what I feel about the maker. And again, it's just personal opinion. Um, a, a dude with a stupid hat and a leotard does not, to me... Uh, He's not striking strike fear, fear. To your heart. Yeah, in my heart. Whereas you know, a really strange, gaunt dude with a lot of leather and a lot of spikes and a lot of buckles and a crown of like of spikes. Uh, also, you can't see his eyes, um, like the maker. But um, his smile's a little bit more terrifying. <laughs> okay. So but, yeah, if we're um, comparing universes here, once I get to issue two, I want to talk to you about because I know this. At least one cool issue two is I issue two was interesting and yeah, yeah I know there's at least one really cool happen. thing that happened so okay yeah. um so I um, will we, stick we, with we, the mic oh go ahead if somebody wants yeah, to chime just in just a talk. couple people just a couple people on uh James Figueroa hey, James James. Hey, buddy. James good evening handsome gents um Will did mention here as well Hickman loves exploring an egotistical character who tries to shape the world in his image Baker Savior Hickman um and, <laughs> and uh, so on and so forth um very yeah absolutely mm-hmm. uh and then james again i agree with bill evil reed has been done better but i like the comic though also hitch has been killing it did you guys see the lax days of lex luther it will be in my box Not on yet. saturday yep yeah I, i've I seen that in my the issue I, the, <laughs> yeah the last thing i remember great. hitch doing was was the hawkman book on the early parts of it and it was phenomenal uh, that book was gorgeous oh, okay. yeah and also oh, his, yeah. his JLA was that great. He wrote wasn't terrible. I mean, from as a writer, I liked it a lot. Yeah, no, yeah. that was it. Felt like a JLA book. You know, it didn't feel mm-hmm. like the Avengers masquerading as them. It was really pretty good, and I, I'd like to see him write more. You know, just like Cliff Chang, yeah. that Catwoman. Jesus, yeah. Christ. Oh my God, that was amazing. Oh God, Lonely you know, City. Give me more Cliff. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Um, I will keep. Uh, myself on the mic because we're going to transition from Marvel to DC and uh, mm-hmm. I know Caleb has a DC book Dude. by acquisition uh, that uh, <laughs> about afterwards and I think I'm going to surprise you when I talk about that book um, 
so uh but the one that i want to talk about is power girl special number one um if you've been following what's been going on in dc post um oh gee i just it's lost my mind um the event they just had lazarus planet um one of the after effects is that Kara, who is now Paige, um, had a change in powers again. Kara started as the Earth 2 Supergirl. She literally was, the, the, you know, the counterpart on that Earth. And um, through a very, you know, I talk about a character with a fluid continuity, you know, she yeah, Hawkman ain't got nothing on her. All right. <laughs> let's, let's just put it that way. That's, um, that's saying a lot too. Yeah. So as you see on the cover, she's trapped there by Johnny sorrow. And it turns out at least by Johnny sorrows estimation, those are, and this is almost keeping with uh, ultimate invasion. They are the only two survivors of a planet that's gone, uh, which is earth too, though. Justice Society of America will beg to differ with you there. Um, anyway, so uh, we have the situation where Power Girl has these new telekinetic powers, and she has been bonded with Omen, Lilith Clay from the Teen Titans, and they've formed a bit of a partnership. And they've started to get to know each other, and then this Johnny Sorrow, who is desperately in love with with Kara Page, I don't know. I can't call her Page. She's still Kara to me. Um, uh, he decides he's going to, you know, do this thing where he takes over the world, and he has like four horsemen um, that are going to help him. And everybody goes to sleep. Uh, you don't need, need to worry about the specifics. Just know that he wants to take over the world, Earth Zero, or Earth Prime, however you characterize it. The main the earth on the dc universe and everybody goes to sleep but it's not a very fitful sleep there's all kinds of shit going on so um because they're telekinetic um and they were aware of this plan ahead of time both lilith and Paige are able to um you know bypass any kind of uh, issues and and stick around and try to solve the matters um one thing i loved about this book is it addressed I, just, I, I can't call her Paige. I'm just going to call her Kara. Uh, it addressed Kara's role in the Superman family. And, um, you know, there's members of the Superman family she's never met. She's never met Superman of China. She barely knows Jonathan, you know, barely knows Connor. Um, and in many ways, it's interesting because she's very much like the huntress of that of that family, you know, that she's part of it, but she's separate, you know. There's, there's enough differences in the genetics, um, the character genetics, uh, to set her apart. And she's going to, uh, and she explains to Lilith, like, you know, uh, you know, if there's anybody that can solve this at Superman, you jumped uh, for a page. I didn't want to talk about the art yet, but here's like uh, just a beautiful page. Um, the uh, writer is um, Leah Williams. And the artist is Margaret Savage, who did most of the colors with Marissa Louise. And through the book, the colors are stunning. They maintain this pastel look. Um, beautiful. Steve, if you can go to the next uh, image that I provided. Um, and this is one of the most important parts. She's in Supergirl's apartment, Kara uh, Zorel, as we know her. And as you see, Streaky's about to blast her again with his kryptonite laser beams out of his eyes. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to see. But, um, you know, one thing about Power Girl, she's always had anger management issues. And she tells Streaky, you know, who's basically just protecting Kara there. Uh, you know, what? I will punch a cat in the face. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> if you don't know me. You know that I will go to that part. And here she's reading this beautifully written section of Supergirl's diary, um, which is, you know, without getting into a lot of specifics, but just basically talks about, you know, how cut off Kara feels from her, yet they should be closest sisters, but, but that Power Girl always pushes her away, whether she means to or not. And um, they defeat Johnny Sorrow through, um, just, just through their sheer willpower and Kara discovering 
what these new telekinetic powers of hers, you know, what the extent of them are. Um, as you can see, Streaky got her approval there where he kind of, um, you know, offers like a uh, while sitting down. And it turns out that Streaky wants to live with her instead of Karen. So at the end, Supergirl has another cat. If you know the history of Justice League International, she had a really messed up cat as a pet. Um, so it's nice to see Supergirl. It's nice to see Power Girl with a cat again. Um, this is a setup for a mini series that's happening in the fall. And um, I'm, I'm, very excited about it and especially excited about there have been attempts in the past to, you know, more, um, you know, more deeply entrench uh, power girl into the Superman family. But this time I think it's going to work. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of situation I know we had uh, with the first book we talked about with Hellfire Gallo, you know, there's some people we know and whose opinions we really re respect um, somebody I know hated this issue, absolutely hated it, hated what they were doing to the character. And I had the absolute exact opposite reaction. I thought this was a wonderful uh, addendum to, to this character's um, legacy and to her, uh, just in her outlook. And I really enjoyed this and um, glad I read it. Power Girl, Power Girl special number one. That's cool. I, I have it. I just, I, yeah. I wasn't sure about, you know, when or why. Oh, I would one thing it. I want to say, oh. you know, there's a few action comics backups with um, Power Girl and Omen. Mm -hmm. You don't have to read them. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you don't good. have to, they give you everything that you need to know in, within, you know, a couple of lines of dialogue here. Of course, I've got to be still pretty confused about the whole like page. Kara, yeah, you know, Kara but Paige is going to be her new civilian identity, I think, to separate her from Kara, and also she was Karen Page. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's a nod to the past, too. So, oh, okay, that's yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, cool, I'll, I'll check it out because I know I have it. It's okay, it's in the boxes in the piles, yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, like I said, somebody I know whose opinion I really value hated this book. And I don't know why they're hating on it. <laughs> I really don't. No. <laughs> I, I thought it was very well done. Um, so Caleb has an omnibu that he yeah. wants to discuss. And I'm going to blow his mind on something about this. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm excited about this, though, because uh, this is this is the book I want to talk about. If you haven't, if you can't see it over here, is a book that's been, you know, it's it, people have t spoken about this book up one side and down the other. It's planetary, right? So this is... Uh, this is Warren Ellis and John Cassidy. They're they're very, very famous, uh, very, very much uh, lauded uh, series that was part of the Wildstorm universe um, in the early Image days, uh, alongside with things like the Authority, um, and then of course now has been acquired by DC um, and has become part of the DC universe. Um, I'm, again, not going to talk about all of the 30-some-odd issues inside this omnibus, if not more than that. Just a broad overview if you've never read it. The story really focuses around this group of four, uh, three people, um, I should say, um, who are planetary. And planetary is a planet-wide um, kind of clandestine organization who is meant to um, to borrow, like, kind of in the Hellboy way. They, they follow the things that go bump in the night. They find the weird things. They keep... They keep the world weird, um, but they want to make sure that it's in, in a way that's manageable. Um, Mr. Snow, who is on the cover of the image that you are seeing now, um, is awoken one day and, and jumps back into it. Um, you find out that he is actually a century baby, much like um, Jenny Quantum uh, and the rest of the people that you've read. Born in the 1900s, he, he's going to live as long as he needs to to meet his purpose. Um, lo and behold, over the overall arcing thing, spoiling something from, from years and years ago, he is the, quote, fourth man, the man that actually controls planetary, like it's his gig. Um, and throughout the story, they are juxtaposed against the evil Fantastic Four, for lack of a better analog. Um, these other folks who went to space, they got hit with radiation, evil geniuses who are trying to conquer the world and take over things. Um and they have to battle for kind of control of the earth and make sure it, it, it's a really fun story. And the superheroics of it all are really well done. And as you would expect from Warren Ellis, 
Now, that being said, the really neat thing to me is that they are not, quote unquote, superheroes or archaeologists, right? Like they are fiction archaeologists. And this story kind of pinpoints in each different issue. It goes into a, quote unquote, genre of fiction, comic book fiction, pop culture fiction, what have you, and really explores what makes it cool, what makes it fun, um, kind of brings out those elements of the genre and just focuses on it as an aspect of of kind of what makes our world weird and 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 the behind the scenes of it all um i i love this story this is the second time i've read it in its totality i think it's very very fun i love i love this era of warren ellis and i know that warren ellis has fallen out of vogue you know it's kind of controversial figure in modern world takes nothing away from his writing um one of the main characters in this book is jaquita as you see here um she is a a very young um Arab uh, woman. Uh, I don't know what her actual uh, lineage is. Um, the drummer is another character who kind of just reads technology. Uh, this is the really cool era of Warren Ellis when the internet was relatively new. People weren't really sure how he worked on it or how exactly it was. But Warren Ellis was really plugged into things like the World Wide Web and, and what it would become. In a lot of ways, he had a lot of foreshadowing and, and predicted a lot of things about the Internet through characters like the drummer, through characters that you see in his other stories. Um, John Cassidy is brilliant, in my opinion. He draws. He kind of has that Frank quietly like detail to him, but it's there's something different about Frank about his work than, than you see with Frank. Quietly, almost like a Stoko quality to it. If you if you're familiar with Stoko's work, um, yeah. But if he decides to use those the parts of his brain, he can also do something, you know, as beautifully stylized as the Lone Ranger. Um, oh yeah, yep. it's definitely John Cassidy. But it's just it, it's just he's using different muscles, right? Um, yeah, I think he's a uh, tremendous artist. I, I, no, I do, I do as well. Like he he is very he he's both stylized, but is able to cover a lot of ground and cover a lot of styles. Um, like you said, he, it's very much him. But when you look into his breadth of work, um, there there is something that tethers it all. But he can kind of move and shift and things. Um, ultimately, it is a battle to save the world and to save the planet from these from the you know evil Fantastic Four. Um, and Snow has to do the thing that I love this character because he is kind of kind of id driven, right? Like so, he, so he is not afraid to piss people off. He's not going to do the thing that you wanted to do, but it's always going to be the right move because he can kind of see the overarching theme of where everything's going. Um, part of it's superpower, part of it's just intuition. And at the end of the book, he kind of gets that British snark that Warren Ellis does really, really well. Um, that like he's like I know I know exactly what we're gonna do. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of like Hellblazer in there with him, right? Like in that attitude. So if this book to me again, if you want to if you want to know about the ins and outs of it, if you want that deep dive, it's been done many many times by people who are who are better equipped to do it than I am and have a longer form to talk about it. Um, to me, this is part of comic books canon, at least in the last 30 years, right? Like, I think that this is an important book to to what comics could be and to the um, just adeptness of, of superhero comics kind of being a sock puppet for other genres, right? Like, they were, this was one of those examples of, like, like we're going to use superhero comics to really talk about everything else in fiction. Um, and I really appreciate it. But Bill promised me something. So I want I want to be shocked and awed. Now, you've said this this is a cornerstone book. This yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I have never read Planetary. The fuck? Yes. <laughs> How? Okay. It had a very spotty publishing history. Oh yeah, yeah. At the time, I got back into comics with the law school thing that we talked about was that period from two thousand and one to two thousand and three, where War when Warren Ellis was really sick. Yeah, and uh, he basically just stopped everything, and that was a delay. So. Uh, when it started up, it was also choppy. There's a three year gap between issues 26 and 27. Mm -hmm. I have the last issue for 27 for some unknown reason. I've read now. I, I'm familiar with the concepts. I've read the crossovers with Batman, with the Authority, yep. and with um, uh, Justice League, which I know are part of that mm -hmm. omnibus. 
uh, so I have enough of the basic background, but it was one of those series like, oh, I'll get to, you know, at some point I'll get to it since I wasn't on the ground floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, you know, especially if it's a DC thing, you know, if yeah. it's a DC marquee title, but I, for some reason it is just a vein. I even have planetary trades, you know, I <laughs> even, you know, it was like, oh, I'll get to it at some point. Um, maybe you've motivated me. I don't know. I uh, hope so. I, I, I really have, do. I have to read it at some point. I know what happens. I know who they are. You know, I've read every page, every page of any authority related book. I was and, well, that was gonna be that was gonna be my next question to make sure you because read there that. is connective like, tissue. Yeah. Um, but why does oh, they, they show up to put this one off uh, to the extent that I did? I have no idea. Here, here's why here's why that surprises me to the extent that it does bill mm-hmm. the book really is they really are archaeologists they are yeah. fiction archaeologists and i think that you would eat that concept yeah. up they dive into what makes the western tick they dive into yeah. what makes godzilla and monster stories tick not only do they, like the surface level but they dive into the whole like con- like history behind okay like no they dropped a nuclear bomb in two different places and part of that reaction is what spurned this fiction to give us kaiju they yeah. drop into time travel and like just everything that you can think of yeah i, I know that there's there's, in, there's um you know that there's uh nods to tarzan and sherlock yes. holmes through it yeah yep. so, so it's not just uh, but and you know those are kind of superheroes by extension. They are. No, you know, they are. That's the, that they're part of the inception of superheroes. Yeah. There's love so, there's Lovecraftian stuff in here. Like they yeah. are archaeologists of of really 20th century fiction. And but I, I have never that, read it. <laughs> I think that you would love the conceptually, I think yeah. it would it would be something that you would latch on to. So yeah. I do encourage you to read it. Absolutely. I will at some point. I just never have. Um Steve, so, have you read it? I have not. Um, but I also, you know, it was part of the era where I wasn't reading any kind of superhero comics whatsoever. Yeah, some or of any it kind is of comics that was yeah, being put out of, some of image. Like nothing out of image. So, you know, for something like that, it's it's on my list of things, you know, authority related that I was going through. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be picking up the Omnibus as well because uh, A. Pennyworths has a beautiful copy that was on the shelf. And I'm like, oh, I should... Um, James mentions here, this is very interesting regarding the art, because it took so long for the series to conclude, you can. like you mentioned, Bill, because yes, there was huge gaps. Yeah, And you can see how Cassidy's art evolved over the years, which is true. I mean, when you have something that lasts, or takes that long to complete, I mean, you have you have long, epic runs with you know other creators as well, where you can see the art really evolve and change. Um, but for something like this, where there's months or even year gaps you know artists are constantly improving their craft and so sometimes you can look at like the first issue of a series and the last issue of a series and say are these the same people yeah you can see some of the same dna in the same it's also interesting with the backstory with this is that this was not an artist enforced um delays this was the writer Mm -hmm. yeah so um you know in the meantime cassidy was doing other stuff yep and it probably he was probably better for that, you know. Yeah, that's pretty it's, cool. It's kind of like uh, um, the the Luther Strode book. Um, you can see Trad oh, Moore yeah. becoming Trad Moore. Justin Jordan's Luther oh. Strode. That that is a perfect example of this. Trad Moore starts out as just kind of the run of a mill like artist, and then becomes Trad Moore by the end of that series. Um, yeah, I can't believe neither of you have read like that. Blows my mind. Um, <laughs> like. Yeah, I, I, I like, yeah, I think you have to read this book. You really do. Oh, my God. And it's like affordable. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not expensive. So, oh, hell. Um, and I, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it looks like Will and I are going to be buying it uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. pretty soon. Because uh, I got to say, Omnibus kind of, kind of scares house. me sometimes. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but but this that, you can get that's it for those fly bitches fly. Um, so my, my copy, um, if I don't drop it on my puppy and kill it, like 75 bucks for this, right? Like that's that, and that's when I there's a soft cover version too, which is, not, yeah, is there, really, there important. is. And you can also get this for less. Like if you go to cheap graphic novels.com or some places like that, like you can get the omnibus for fairly like affordable price. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and, and, and this has all the crossovers with, like, the authority. It's got the Batman crossover at the end of it, so it's got all of that included in here, along with covers, a lot of back matter. You actually get some of Warren Ellis' script, which is another thing. For those of you who are aspiring comic writers, and you're like, <laughs> how do I write comics? Um, yeah, like, like yeah. it's got script examples from Warren Ellis in here, and, and that's the way you learn how to write anything, right? Like, you model yeah, My trade is kind of bare bones. Um yeah, uh, a lot of those I want y'all to read back. In the we're gonna have to do that. Yeah, I want y'all to read this so badly, so so badly. <laughs> okay, we All will. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Steve, why don't you take us out on a more independent note? Okay. Well, speaking of image, I mean, uh, I'm just gonna throw it up here. Um, I've been reading about it. I, I've been reading this book for the past three years since uh, since it started. I've talked about it maybe once or twice on the show before, um, and that is Firepower, which just came back after a several month hiatus uh, for issue number 25. And, um, you know, it's double sized, I guess. I mean, these are usually pretty, pretty well packed issues as they as they currently stand. Um, but this one's a, an interesting issue because it's kind of a it, it's a interlude. Um, of a book usually in like the 25th issue you get like a massive thing something crazy happens it's really huge whatever um but for this it's you know it, it's an interlude it's a it's a pause in what has been a crazy you know whirlwind action-packed series um and basically the great old serpent uh this giant dragon has been raised um you have a uh, you know, the the main bad guy, Master Shaw, is controlling the dragon, or the dragon's controlling him, who knows. They basically destroyed Hong Kong. Almost everybody has been defeated. Uh, Owen, who's the main character here that you can see on the cover, he was able to temporarily defeat him, um, you know, using his uh, the power of the fire that comes from his soul. And then he finds out in at the end of the last issue that his parents, uh, who he always thought were killed by the evil cult uh, that helped raise the dragon, um, were actually killed by uh, his former master, Wei Lun, who he's facing off across here. And what you would expect in this kind of book is like, okay, it's going to be a massive knockout drag down battle between these two where Owen's like, ah, I got to take revenge for killing my parents. Not at all. It is a very quiet, uh, a lot of a lot of talking, a lot of dialogue, and a lot of personal growth in this issue, which is good. And it's so, um, you know, it's uh, Hickman and of course Samney on art. They've been working together on this series uh, since the beginning, and they've been doing a really good job. And I think that it's um, Did you say you Hickman know, or Kirkman? Very... Kirkman, sorry, not Hickman. Gotcha. Kirkman, Robert Kirkman, not Hickman. Robert Kirkman and Chris Samney have been on those books since the beginning. Um, and they, they just have been doing an amazing job with it. It is a fun read. There's a great family dynamic at the heart of it, as well as, you know, really, I would say, fleshed out characters from, you know, the periphery. You know, these the characters from the schools, uh, you know, from these ancient Kung Fu schools that you would kind of, you know, usually see attributed just sort of, you know, ridiculous little attributes or characteristics. And then that's kind of like their whole personality. And that's the whole character is just sort of this, you know, they are, they're the big crazy one, or that is the really pretty, but deadly assassin. Like they're, everybody's very much given uh, a role to play that allows them to breathe and to expand. So they're not just pigeonholed. And I think that the storytelling here is wonderful. Mix is great with the crazy kung fu magic action, um, but also has these kinds of moments where you have a, an entire issue where people are just kind of talking about like, oh man, okay, so Hong Kong's destroyed. The dragon's not fully defeated. The world's going to be completely overrun by this evil dragon that's going to either enslave the planet or kill everybody. And we're the only ones who can stop it. What do we do? we need to figure out how to bring out our own internal fire. And, you know, there's a lot of emotional growth that has to happen. Uh, and that's kind of what you see here on this page. And this isn't really spoiling too, too much, but it's basically, you know, this is how they feel that they are going to be able to progress. Um, I, I think this is such a great, 
I'd say it's a workhorse title. It's one where it does a lot. It doesn't come out too, too often, but every issue that I read is joyful. So I always enjoy everything that I'm reading from this. Even, uh, you know, even mixed in with something as crazy heavy where everybody dies, like Hellfire Gala <laughs> this year. Um, this is a book where, sure, a lot of people die, but also there's a lot of people who survive. And they have a nice, happy family life, and there's humor, and there's a lot of, you know, togetherness and talking. So, with Kung Fu Action, um, Firepower from Image, definitely check it out. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, move on. I think we have some geek gets. Uh, each of us have something that we got that is a little bit geeky. That's something we got. We, I got to do better intro to that. I'm so used to the that like airtight wolf of the week. I got to do something a little bit better. Like <laughs> <laughs> they're gets and they're geeky. Yeah, they're gets and they're geeky. All right, Steve, <laughs> Mister, I never get anything. You got something, so why don't you show it? I got a couple things. So. um Last week, I think with possibly. the one thing anymore. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I got, but I got two yes, things. Yes, do you two things? Right no, no, no. Look, I'm showing you two no. things right in front of you. These are the uh, Happy Meal toys from McDonald's uh, for the Marvels. The Marvels isn't coming out until November, but the Happy Meal toys are out now. So you can get your uh, Princess Carol. I'm sure, it's a plot point. Uh, or you can get. Um, you know, your good old I'm goose. Uh, and, and of course. His oh, I need, I need that. I need that. That's awesome. I need that. So absolutely, you know, happy meal toys. Time to get those snacks. Uh, but yeah. Was Marvel's originally was supposed to come out in August? Was you know, that's Mar a good question. I know it did move things. So maybe it was yeah. originally August. Okay, that they makes sense. Changed yeah. 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 Yeah, the toy rollout. It'll also be interesting uh, to see if we have some other moves yeah. because of the uh, as the uh, writers and, and actors strike goes on, you know, without the benefit of promotion. Yeah, there probably. may be some other things that get pushed back. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I also have some Kickstarter stuff, but I'll save that for next time. Okay. All right, Caleb, how about you? Um, I'll stick. Get I'll stick with the one geek get rule as, as, as long as it's a uh, like a qualification so my buddy arnie um reached out and uh, said hey i'm selling some action figures and i'm not really an action figure guy uh but i he was like you want anything so i got a puppy no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, no so but he reached out and i was like you know what I, scarlet witch the hulk or whatever he's like well i don't have scarlet witch but i've got some things you might be interested in so i bought some stuff from him so i've got a new hulk Ooh. a new namor mm -hmm. um, and also jamie madrox who's hanging off my microphone up here um and of course, because they're the the they, they come with all kinds of goodies like different like hands and heads and stuff like that. But I've got I've got action figures now. They're Mar Marvel Legends series and it's fun stuff. So I bought those from my friend Ernie. Mm, cool. cool. Well, I also have Marvel Legends figures too. But I have the Secret Wars almost scale retro versions of Canada ish. That were like the, three, the three and three quarters. Nice. Ooh. Now the thing is, if I don't know if you can see there, as a price of four ninety nine. So these are going to clearance. They ended the line for now. We've we've gone. We've talked about this on the show before. So these are you know hitting some of the clearance stores. So uh, I know they they are at some Ollies. I got these from Big Lots. So Ooh. I got Thor. Beautiful sculpt, beautiful packing, and for people who give a shit, an unpunched card. All Ooh. Ooh. I've got <laughs> Natasha. I got Black Widow. Very cool. Oh wow, yeah, old design Black Widow. Yep, I got Black Panther. Nice. And I guess for legal reasons, I have Marvel's The Thing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, really happy to get those. Um, I also know for some people, you know, probably the most sought after one is the Ghost Rider with a um, uh, motorcycle. And those are on uh, clearance at many targets if you can find them for like $16.99 or something, uh, which is That's a lot from 25 Yeah. And, but these are all well, like $5. Hey, David, how you doing? And uh, hey, I also wanted to thank hey, David. Thank you. For, for chiming in there, David. Um, James and Will, thank you so much for joining us through this evening. Absolutely. Really appreciated your comments through this. 
Um, yep. So we're going to wrap this show up. And when we wrap an episode of the comic book bears up, we do so with a segment we call the Woofs of the week in the bear community. If you find a fellow attractive, you woof at him. And we do something very similar. We woof at, uh, something that may be a comic book, but it also may be a TV program or a charitable initiative or something else. Anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener or viewer, may be interested in sampling. I'll start, as I always do, with Steve. Steve, what is your Wolf of the Week? Well, of course, it's a TV wolf. I mean, why wouldn't it be? Because that's all I ever do when I'm not reading comics. I'm just watching tons of TV um, or playing Diablo 4. <laughs> uh, so for TV... Today was released the um, musical episode of Strange New Worlds. And, of course, Strange New Worlds has just been an absolute joy. We had the crossover episode with uh, Lower Decks a couple weeks ago, and that was absolutely fantastic. And then this week we had an all-musical episode, which really is probably one of the best musical episodes I've seen since uh, Once More With Feeling uh, from Buffy so many years ago. This one does have a lot of personal songs. There's not a big, there was, of course, a big ensemble number. There, there are a couple of those, um, but it's a lot of personal stuff, and it's so good. It's so good. So definitely go check it out on Paramount Plus or wherever you see it. Okay, cool. Over to Caleb. Caleb, what is your Wolf of the Week? Well, I'm going to join Steve in woofing out a TV show. Um, today, in, if you live in the States, it's the debut of Heartstoppers Season 2 on Netflix. Um, this, if you've listened to me on the show before, I'm a huge Alice Osman fan. I love this series. It started off life as a graphic novel and become this. Um, it is about a young gay couple that meet in high school, become boyfriends. It's very wholesome, very cute. Um, it's just about kids getting like queer kids getting to date and like, like in the ways that every like non queer kids get to and discover each other and explore being a teenager together and figure things out. And it's just, it's really sweet. I don't know how else to put it. It's it's very sweet. Deals with some heavy issues, but in a very cool way. Um, I, I encourage everyone to read this. Go get the Heartstoppers graphic novels or the actual novels that are related to it. There's a whole slew of them. I have a whole shrine up here for Alice Osmond. Um, <laughs> so, seen the shrine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great series. And watch it. First season, if you haven't seen it, is is it will. It's it's very cool. Very cool. Okay, Steve, I have a graphic for my Wolf of the Week uh, last mm-hmm. Wednesday, uh, which was really nice because we actually had a break in the heat, uh, kind of like a two-day break. Uh, I saw the Letting It Go show, which features Culture Club and Howard Jones in Berlin. And uh, this was at the, uh, used to be known as the Garden State Art Center. It's now known as the PNC Bank Art Center in Homedale, New Jersey. And it was a situation where, um, you know, I'm wrapping up a project at work. So it was very intense, very intense work days uh, un- until last Monday, until this, um, just this past Monday. And um, this was what I needed. You know, I needed attending a show with two other guys that I'm really proud to call friend and you know to enjoy music from your teenage years i know i'm not one that is like completely focused on nostalgia because you gotta live in the here and now but to have something like this um it it just came at the perfect time uh the tour goes on through i think very early september uh mostly in the midwest out to california and then for australians like david um you can also see uh, a series of dates in australia without howard jones but still with culture club and berlin uh when that hits uh australia new zealand in the i think mid-september um but if, if this is music that resonates with you if you're around my age you know, I yield to sand and, uh, you know, you enjoy, uh, you know, there's a lot of plenty of younger people that dig 80 stuff yeah. too. Um, it, this was a really well constructed show. And plus, you know, again, with the, um, um, with the news that, uh, this had hit last Wednesday, which was the day that they had, uh, revealed that the night before that Sinead O'Connor had passed away. Um, we had dedications from Terry Nunn and from boy George yeah. uh, to particular songs. So, you know, there was an emotional component to it as well. Um, yeah. but it was just, I, I needed that show. I really needed it. And, um, if other people are, um, you know, wired like I am, um, 
that's my wolf of the week. I think you'd enjoy it too. Okay. Mm. <laughs> uh, so that's another episode down. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. We're going to end the show like at two hours on the dot. This is great. You see, the, <laughs> you see the time? That's awesome. Uh, again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the uh, not Blue Sky. I can only get. I only have the one invite so far. I don't even know uh, if you can do like, threads. I guess we have threads. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we're not technically on Twitter anymore because Twitter is now X. X. Um, yeah, right. Uh, I Only don't X. That. That's the one situation I think dead naming is okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and the Instagram is Comic Book Bears. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears Podcast. If you want to write to us, please do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. If you want to listen to us, you can listen to us through, uh, download us through Apple Podcast until the end of the month through Stitcher Radio. I promise we're going to get directly onto other platforms, but we are also available on many other podcatchers. Until next time, I'm Bill Zanowitz. I'm Steve Morey. I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. You're going to hear a wolf in an explosion. We'll be back in two weeks. Take care, everyone. Wolf! Oh.